Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the IAU Symposium 350 Public Lecture Series. We are really honoured to welcome all of you that are here in the room to Jesus College Cambridge, and also all of you worldwide, I'm going to wave and say hello, good evening. It's really nice to have you joining us on this very live broadcast. Um, my name is Dr Helen Fraser. I am a senior lecturer at the Open University in Milton Keynes in the United Kingdom. The Open University for the past 50 years has made it its mission to open up education for all. It is the world's leading distance learning education institution and on Tuesday of next week we celebrate our 50th anniversary. And we are very, very grateful that because of this 50th anniversary celebration, we've been able to worldwide broadcast these lectures this evening. However, we're also here today because this week here in Cambridge, we have nearly 200 eminent laboratory astrophysicists. They are people who do astronomy in the lab. That's a rather unusual thing. Meeting here through the professional body, the International Astronomical Union. Founded in 1919 in Brussels, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the International Astronomical Union just last week, and I am the current president of the um, Laboratory Astrophysics Commission of that uh, um, esteemed institution. So we're really combining all of this together tonight to bring you this wonderful series of lectures. Now, our speaker tonight is Dr. Kimberly Enico. Many of you won't know, but I'm going to tell you this. Kim and I were um, housemates when we did our PhDs here in Jesus College. Um, neither of us are now here in Jesus College, but it's really exciting. We've uh, met again for the first time in many, many years um, to bring you this lecture series. Kim is a NASA research astrophysicist. Um, I know she really loves drinking tea, um, but she also is an absolutely inspiring communicator of science. She's worked on an absolute wealth of different missions at NASA, and I know from my time when I used to share a house with her that that was her childhood dream, to work for NASA. So um, without further ado, you don't want to hear any more from me, but I am going to hand you over to Dr. Lee Kimberly Enico to give her lecture, which is entitled A Cosmic Tasting Menu, Dust, Ice and Water, Connecting Laboratory Studies to Space Exploration. Big round of applause for Kim, please. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to um, share a, a taste of some pretty interesting things that this laboratory astrophysics, an attempt to recreate the environment of our beautiful universe and how it maps to some of the space exploration that we're doing. We live in such a rich age. Um, if the um, house lights could come down a little bit. So I've titled the talk, A Cosmic Tasting Menu, to focus on three areas. There's many things that one could talk about to share with you about our amazing universe and what we're learning about it today. But I'm going to focus on three areas. Before I begin, a little bit about myself. Um, I tend to, I'm not a laboratory astrophysicist. I am the one who builds the instruments to take the data. And um, I build things, I test things, Sometimes I destroy things, sometimes I'm paid to destroy things, but I'm always learning. And um, this is a, a few examples of me in the lab um, building cameras and spectrometers and different types of instruments to bring to the astronomers the wonderful data. And what drives me and what I think drives a lot of us is the shared human nature of curiosity. And I like this quote from Walt Disney, we keep moving forward, opening new doors, and doing new things because we're curious, and curiosity keeps us leading down new paths. So my work at NASA has been so varied because I'm seeing a lot of things that I'm curious about and where I can help to bring these beautiful pictures. Throughout the talk, I'll be showing examples of the universe, and uh, I will put in the top left um, the object that we're looking at, and I'm going to put on a laser pointer for those online to see, 
and in the bottom right, a reference to the satellite or the telescope that took, or the person who took those images. Because we live in such a rich information age, so much data, the universe is beautiful. This is a picture of the Milky Way, taken, compiled from the ESA Gaia satellite, which has measured the positions of stars, almost two billion stars in this image, and has mapped out, this is our home, our home galaxy. A very beautiful place to live in. And to set the mood, um, the former uh, professor at Cornell, Dr. Carl Sagan, has wonderful quotes. He had um, hosted a, a television series, but I really like this one because it hones into some themes that will come up during the talk. The nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. And it's just a reminder of we are here today not you know, because of a long history of things happening in the universe. A very famous image, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, taken with the, one of the most powerful telescopes, the Hubble Space Telescope. And we as the human species, not just those professional astronomers, we're yearning for answers to these age-old questions. How does the universe work? How did we get here? Are we alone? Helen mentioned that um, we're meeting today in Jesus College, Cambridge. And this week, researchers from all over the world have come here to share their latest data, their interpretations, to ask new questions from both the heavens and the laboratory. We have a body of laboratory astrophysics who are attempting to cre recreate conditions in the universe, low temperature, low pressure, high radiation, to try to make sense of our beautiful universe. So we have pictures like this. This is the Horsehead Nebula in Orion, taking at long wavelengths by the Herschel Space Telescope, showing the beauty and complexity of our marvelous universe. And then we have the laboratory astrophysicists who are trying to recreate that environment, those cold temperatures, those low densities, um, and trying to, can we explain the beauty of the universe in which we live? So in a sense, the field of laboratory astrophysics is a Rosetta Stone. It's this translator, a bridge between the astronomers making these observations of the universe can't quite explain what they're seeing, then the chemists and the physicists in the lab and the computer scientists putting together models, theories, and actual experiments to try to make sense of what the data we're seeing. And that's what this week here at, in Cambridge, the um, conference, is about. So to get on to the tasting menu, there was no way I could have covered all the topics that laboratory astrophysics talk about. So I wanted to focus on three particular areas to give you a taste of the richness of this field today and also the fact that we have so many open questions. And it's just this combining the observational world with the laboratory has providing us these new ways of looking at problems. So let's start with dust. The universe is a very dusty place. Now, I'm using the word dust. It doesn't mean dirty. It means tiny. Dust as tiny particles of solid material floating around in space between the stars. So it's not the same as the dust in your house, you know, the pet dander or the pollen or pieces of soil. It's more like smoke. Particles the size of a few molecules to grains of a few millimeters. But it's everywhere. So why is studying dust important? It's actually part of our origins, how we came to be. Dust helps stars to form. This is a picture of Betelgeuse, a red giant in the constellation of Orion. And the dust, in our understanding, for, is created 
when stars are being born. We know the dust is also everywhere in our solar system. It's including our Earth, because all the objects in our solar system formed from the dust that created our solar system. It's found on the moon, on asteroids, on comets, on the rings of planets. We've spotted dust storms on Mars. And seeing dust in the ice plumes, the geysers of the icy moons, in this case here, Enceladus, around Saturn and also Europa around Jupiter. So you can see we have a common, it's everywhere. But there's a lot we don't know about dust. Now dust also hides things. So dust is considered a nuisance to some astronomers. Um, this is a picture um, from an um, amateur astronomer taking a picture of the Taurus molecular cloud. And you may aspy to see uh, Pleiades, the seven sisters in the lower right. And uh, the dark streaks across the sky is the dust. So it's become a nuisance to the optical astronomers because it's hidden a lot of interesting things. When we have the technology and the tools to look at light at different wavelengths, particularly at the longer wavelengths, we reveal a different part. This is an image taken from the Herschel Infrared Space Telescope. And what you'll find is the dust is glowing. And we can see through the dust, and we can also measure the properties of the dust and reveal the universe in new ways. Let's go back to the image of our Milky Way again, this beautiful Gaia compository mm -hmm. in the visible light. You can now see the dust in our Milky Way. We have a lot of dusty areas along the, um, the, the center of our galaxy, and it obscures a lot. That same projection of the Milky Way at longer wavelengths looks like this in the longer wavelengths. The universe looks totally different when we look at it with different eyes. Our beautiful Milky Way, and here we're seeing the dust. What's fascinating is over half of the light since the Big Bang is absorbed and then re-radiated at those long wavelengths. So in a sense, the dust is converting stolen starlight. It absorbs it and re-emits it at the longer wavelength. So it's everywhere, yet its properties and its origins are poorly understood. I was privileged to be part of a team to build an instrument that flew on the Spitzer Space Telescope, a mission to reveal this hidden universe. As a postdoc at the University of Arizona, I was building cameras that were sensitive to these wrong wavelengths of light. I, they were cutting edge. The top right was a, a camera that was sensitive at 70 microns, a very long wavelength, and the bottom right, a little bit further, out into 160 microns. We literally were clamping these detectors to change the properties of the germanium crystal to allow long wavelength light to be detected because we were hunting dust. And um, it's just, um, it was an amazing experience to be part of building something that our eyes couldn't see and reveal the universe in new ways. So Spitzer launched in 2003. And uh, here are some of the early results with the camera I helped build. So first I'll show you the visible because it helps with putting a context. This is um, one of the nearest galaxies, the Andromeda Galaxy, taken in visible light from the Kitt Peak Observatory in Arizona. And it's two and a half million light years away. Um, what you're seeing is the starlight. You see the large bulge in the center. You see a spiral structure. And you also see the dust, these dark lanes. One of the early images of, of the Andromeda Galaxy that are took with the, our instrument that I helped build looks like this in the far infrared. We took the sharpest image ever of dust in another galaxy. 
and it revealed the presence of the dust, and we also were able to see the active areas of star formation along the spiral arms. In a comparison, we also used different wavelengths of light to learn about the temperature of the dust. The warmest dust emits at the shorter wavelengths and the coldest dust at the longer wavelengths. And so a compiling of wavelengths of light here, we can put together what might be happening and the temperature wise in the universe. So using dust as a thermometer. So dust is everywhere in the cosmos. <coughs> it's in the stellar birth, when stars are burning, uh, being born, to stellar death and creating and being um, emitted into the space between the stars. It's in the beginnings of planets. This um, observatory in the Atacama Desert in Chile, the Alma Interferometry, is making these beautiful pictures of planets being formed around stars. And it's in galaxy-wide scales. But despite its fundamental importance and its being everywhere, we don't know where most dust originates, what it's made of, what its properties are, how does it evolve in different environments, what is its physical chemistry. So there's a mystery, several mysteries. One in particular, astronomers have been observing dusty environments and they calculate from when the stars are generating a lot of dust and then supernovas are exploding and blowing apart dust, it turns out there's more dust around than should have been destroyed. So it opened the question, do we, need, do we have another mechanism to make dust? So enter in the laboratory astrophysicist. So Cornelia Jaeger from Jena, Germany, um, I would, if I was to call her a superhero, she has the power of destroying and creating dust in the lab. So she experiments with trying to figure out, can you make dust? And if you make dust, does it match what we see in the universe? So a laboratory astrophysicist will have a lab as crazy like this with wires and um, equipment and things going bleep, bleep, bleep. But in her case, making the dust, she uses a laser. The laser illuminates a chamber. The chamber contains her little particles that are in a matrix at really cold temperatures and very low vacuum. And then as she builds up the dust, she uses a spectrometer. Spectrometer spreads the light over different wavelengths, and she collects data like this. And what this is showing is if you were, um, these are a spectra of what she's creating, the silicate dust of a function of it growing, and there's a feature around nine microns, which is increasing with time. So she knows she's creating dust. She takes that spectra. The other thing that her lab's been doing is taking scanning electron microscopy images of the dust that she's making. So we're finally getting a first glimpse into a property of what the dust might look like. And they've made both silicates, this is a silicate-based dust, and a carbon-based dust. Again, we don't really know what dust is made of. We have spectral signatures that astronomers have been taking, and they have these, freak, these emission bands or absorption bands at certain wavelengths that we can then use in the laboratory to identify what we're really looking at. So these, the group, um, Professor Jaeger has been creating dust. She's also been destroying it. She will power up that laser and look what happens when she destroys the dust. She's also learned she's creating dust at different temperatures. And she unveiled an interesting um, observation that the structures she's creating when she creates low temperature dust versus high temperature dust are very similar. So they hope they're on the point of finding there may be another mechanism to make this hidden dust that was a mystery to the observationalists. Again, I was mentioning this mystery that the astronomers had had that there was more dust in these star formation regions than they were expected to be because the dust should have been destroyed by the supernova. Turns out you can actually make dust in cold environments between the stars. Dust is very important because we've also, through astronomy, have learned that this is the place where you form molecules. A lot of our molecules and the complexity of our universe grows and gets um, brings about um, the universe as we see because of the presence of dust grains. So what's next for dust studies? 
One emerging field is um, the role of magnetic fields on star formation. And um, <clears throat> so dust particles in the presence of a magnetic field can be aligned. And when they're aligned, they'll preferentially direct the light. We measure this as polarization. And um, the um, image that you're showing here was taken with um, a project that I was on recently, the Flying Telescope Sophia, where we have a new instrument to measure properties of dust through its polarization. And so we are mapping these type of properties of dust, and now what questions do these open? And what do we need to uh, build with the laboratory um, to make sense of a very complicated um, interaction? So I move on to ice. So ice, where it's cold in the universe, it could mean ice in the way you think of water, ice, meaning ice as the frozen, when water goes from a liquid to a solid. We can also use ice to explain, or as a terminology for exotic ices, ices that are not made of water. So we're most familiar here on Earth with water ice. And also, if you've gone to any Halloween events or been to uh, stage shows, you'll see dry ice. Dry ice is carbon dioxide that has been um, lowered the, uh, the temperature and increased the pressure to make it into a solid form. And um, we have carbon dioxide ice on the poles of Mars. And we have ices throughout the universe. And we've been studying ices for decades. Rosetta visited um, Comet 67P um, a few years ago, the rubber ducky comet, if you remember that in the news. And um, there was a, a kilometer-sized patch of ice at the neck of the duck. And there's you know water ice all over this comet. The uh, moons of uh, the giant planets are very icy, they're very cold. Uranus and Neptune are cold ice giants because they actually have the coldest atmospheres in our solar system. And they're made up of very different types of composition. Uranus is made out of methane, ammonia, and water. And we have moons of, this is the moon Triton, um, a moon of Neptune, um, which has nitrogen ice, methane ice, carbon monoxide ice. So ices are everywhere where the temperatures and pressures are right to have what would have been in a liquid form be in the solid form. But how do we know they're ices? So we can't, with the exception of Earth, we can't go there to sample them ourselves. So we use spectroscopy. And spectroscopy, the ice signatures are, have very broad, they have different wavelengths, and there's an entire talk all about laboratory astrophysics for ices, because it's quite complex on how the ices interact with each other. Um, and we have water ice found in stars. So here's a picture of a spectra, and I'm indicating here signatures of where water ice is located in the spectra. So we have ice um, in not just our solar system, but also in stars. We see these ice between low mass stars, which is shown here, and high mass stars, which brings us the question, this zeroth generation of ice in our, our universe is perhaps universal across the galaxy, and why should that be? So ice is a very important ingredient of the cosmos. So I was very privileged to have an opportunity to work on a mission to a distant icy world. This is NASA's New Horizons mission. It was a mission that flew to Pluto. And uh, it has a spacecraft the size of a baby grand piano. And it was one of the fastest spacecraft we'd be able to launch from Earth. It launched in 2006 with a really beefy rocket and it's traveling at about 31,000 miles per hour. And it got to Pluto in nine and a half years. When I joined the project, the spacecraft was between Uranus and Neptune. 
So I wasn't part of building the instruments. My job on New Horizons was to ensure that the instruments were ready to take the pictures, the spectra of Pluto, such that we would have this rich data set. So its primary science target was Pluto, and it took nine and a half years for the mission to get there. Now we knew a lot about Pluto before we sent a spacecraft there. This was the best image we had. <laughs> From the Hubble Space Telescope, taken in 1994, with a resolution of 200 kilometers per pixel. We knew that it had a bright parts to it, and it had um, darker bits to it. We also knew that its surface was made up of these exotic ices, methane, nitrogen, carbon uh, monoxide. And uh, that was from our ground-based spectra. And, and it showed that the surface had varied with longitude. But we go from that to up close and personal, and our image of Pluto was transformed. So our understanding of Pluto is just emerging. So you go from 10 pixels across to thousands of pixels across, and you have these dilemmas. And you even have these beautiful images. I don't know if you remember from the flyby in 2015, uh, Pluto, two thirds the size of Earth's moon, has shown itself to have a very thick atmosphere with layers of haze. It has mountains, it has glaciers, and this image is showing the southern part of this large uh, glacier plateau. This image was taken just 15 minutes after the closest approach. Looking back, you can see some of the shadows of the mountains. No one expected mountains, no one expected glaciers. I remember I was in the room when the pictures came down and our geologist had said, we need to get a glaciologist on the team because we had not <laughs> expected to see this. And the new image shows that we, it has an earth-like hydrological coil. So we have something from the surface evaporating into the atmosphere, forming clouds. The clouds are now raining snow and it's coming and covered. A lot of questions. So um, I was part of the payload team. So we were in the payload engineering cave while the data was coming down. We're monitoring how the instruments are doing. Um, and uh, uh, there was a, as a deputy project scientist, we had seven instruments and I was in, looking to make sure they were all well calibrated and ready for this historic encounter. We had cameras, spectrometers, we had instruments that could sniff the solar wind, particle detectors. We had a dust instrument that was built by undergraduates at the University of Colorado. The first ever instrument of this kind passed Saturn. And we even used the 2.1 meter high gain antenna as an instrument in its own right. It was very clever. The designers of this mission really thought about how to pack a lot into a small package. So let me focus a little bit about one instrument in particular, because we're talking about ICES. The, um, there was a camera and a spectrometer instrument that um, uh, was designed specifically for help us to understand better the composition, what is the surface of Pluto made out of. So this is the, one of the actual data from the, uh, the LISA spectrometer um, aboard the New Horizons spacecraft. You're actually seeing, that's Pluto, and um, the, the, the movie will uh, repeat itself because we did a flyby. So we were only catching data as it flew by. As Pluto went into the field of view, it's, it's being mapped onto the spectrometer, and you can start to see absorption lines because this is a function of wavelength. You also see that Pluto is bouncing. We did all our pointing with thrusters. We didn't have any fancy gyroscopes or any of these things to make everything steady. steady. Um, any of the pointing was done by um, small alterations in the thrusters. And this was all done with longevity of a spacecraft, and that's another title for another talk. But we have this beautiful, um, rich data set because, again, before we had images that were 10 pixels across, now we have thousands of pixels across. Also, we now have spectra. So what did we learn? So being there, looking at the data, it was amazing. So we, this world from that blurry Hubble image to that New Horizon mission, but then we're getting spectral information. So we would be deep in thought trying to figure out what in the world we were seeing, because a lot of the things had not been 
anticipated. And we would often have a lot of heated discussions over what we might be seeing or what we needed to rule out. So in particular, with the spectra, um, what Pluto looked like in regards to its ISIS was very confusing at first. So we were mapping what the different spectra were telling us. And so we would have this dark bit that had a relatively very flat spectra, very, very flat, with no features. Part of the heart of Pluto would have these really strong absorption features, which would turn out to be very methane, would have this unidentified feature for a long time until we learned a little bit more about the surface. We would have these um, areas where we would have water. Water had never been detected on Pluto from the ground. So this was a discovery from having a spacecraft fly by Pluto. We would learn that the highland regions with the mountains had their own spectra and the poles were very different. So what we would do with these data sets is spread them out based on the ices, the types of ices species, and learning why there should be ices in certain parts. So we had nitrogen that was kind of fixated on certain parts. Carbon monoxide was only located in a very small region. Methane was everywhere. And then the surprising of finding water. When you add water to chemistry, it makes some very interesting byproducts. So in addition to the spectra, we had a color camera. And this is what Pluto looks like in color. It's the other red planet. Now, the red planet Mars, its coloring is due to rust. Iron, in the presence of oxygen, it's turning red. The coloring on Pluto is due to something different. So why is Pluto red? Laboratory astrophysicists. We have to bring in laboratory astrophysicists to help us explain what could be going on. We need to be able to simulate the environment at Pluto, these exotic ices at low temperatures and low pressures, and the right radiation. So Dr. Chris Mataresi at NASA Ames, where I, where I work, um, he and his colleagues have been looking at how can, the, how can we explain the red color on Pluto. And um, in the lab, they recreated this environment. They took ice samples that had methane and nitrogen and carbon monoxide at low temperature. They bombarded it with electrons to break it apart. And they looked at what they, they created. And they created a structure of a material that had oxygen and nitrogen and organic molecules. And they were deriving a notional structure. And they found that this material they were creating in the lab had urea, carboxyl oxides, ketones, amines, nitriles. It was red-brown in color. And it fits the description of what we were seeing on Pluto. Now, Pluto has a range of these colors from white to brown. And if you vary the amount of nitrogen that's in your resulting goo that you're making, you can explain the variety of colors on Pluto. And this is still evolving soon. So we think you know, we have one possible explanation. Now, these are a, um, a category of organics called tholins. It's an esoteric term. It's actually been around for a while. Tholins can be formed in an atmospheric environment. The reason why Titan, Saturn's moon, Titan's atmosphere is a little orange is because it's got methane and nitrogen that's been undergoing radiation and forming this brown, orangey um, aerosol. On Pluto, on the surface, we have tholins in a solid form from these ices being irradiated. And then there's some interesting new questions about. So we'll go back to this beautiful color of Pluto. Um, a paper that just came out, I would say, last week or 10 days ago, but by Dale Cruikshank, along with the, um, the large team, and was focusing on now mapping the colors of Pluto to the geological activities. So we focused on one particular area on Pluto where there's a crater and a chasm. And what's shown here in blue is it has a strong water signature. The water signature shown by the spectra show these absorption features. Curiously, it has its own unique color, a different type of tholin. So we're trying to explain the color on Pluto by 
the, the hypothesis is the ices under the presence of radiation are going to break apart and recombine and are going to form these organic molecules that have the colors of red to brown, yellow, red to brown. And we've, um, Dale and his team had noticed that there are places on Pluto that even have a different signature. And so there's a new hypothesis to put a challenge to laboratory astrophysicists. So the hypothesis is when these tholins, these organic molecules, are located where there's water, or where there's water and ammonia, the chemical modelers would predict that the combination of those, those organics will make even more complex organics, like amino acids and nucleobases, the building blocks of what we call DNA and RNA. This is not to say that Pluto has this. The hypothesis is it's very curious. Now, the spectra that we've taken with the observatory, with the, the spacecraft, didn't have the closest spatial resolution to distinguish what was going on, especially in that area. So the thing on the table is, could there be a scenario where you have water coming up from beneath the surface of Pluto, call it cryolava, because it's really cold. Somehow the pressures are enough to have it ooze out into the surface. And then it's interacting with these surface <coughs> organics. According to the chemist models, it could be creating these complex organics. So the lab needs to work to that next step. What's needed is looking at flow rates of water and um, ammonia at these low temperatures and pressures and see whether you can actually recreate in the lab what might be going on in Pluto. So this is work ahead for ice in laboratory astrophysics. And <coughs> New Horizons flew by um, its second target uh, three and a half years later, in January 1st of this year. It flew another billion miles and passed by this little one. So it's 1% the size of Pluto, and it's a bit redder than Pluto. So um, one of the interesting observations or the questions we have is these objects in the outer solar system, which may be remnants of the earliest of our solar system, is there composition from the, uh, the interstellar material that created it, or is it the result of processing, processing that occurred over the four or five billion years the solar system was forming? We have still yet to get the spectra of this object, but it will be very interesting to, to understand what this is made of and whether in the laboratory one could recreate again what might be going on 2014 MU69. Okay. So let's move on to my third of the tasting menu, water. very familiar place. It's our home. It's a very preci precious liquid water world. So liquid water is covering three quarters of our surface. Earth is the only planet known to have stable bodies of liquid water. We still don't know how Earth got its water. We know that water is essential for life as we know it. So the hunt and the understanding of where one can find liquid water has been at the top of many lists to understand, you know, how do we get here and are we alone? So our precious little water world. And I mentioned we don't know how Earth got its water. We had this surprise a couple of years ago when um, the Rosetta mission had encountered a Jupiter family comet, the comet 67P. And um, this was a comet that was formed out in what we call the Kuiper Belt. This is out beyond Pluto. It's coming around the sun, but then it gets trapped by Jupiter's gravity, and so it winds itself in a, a six and a half year orbit um, in between Mars and Jupiter. So it's called a Jupiter family comet. Um, but it originally came from out there. And the Rosetta mission, when they encountered it and um, put the Philae lander on it, they had measured the water from this comet and learned that the water is not like the water on Earth. 
So up to now, we had thought perhaps comets were the sources of water of Earth. And we have an example where, no, it may be a much more complicated story. Perhaps the water came from asteroids, or perhaps it came from other places. So uh, it's been interesting that the hunt for where our water came from is still a very un un unanswered question. So we look towards other places of water, because again, where there's water, did we lose? Okay. So as liquid water is a key ingredient for life, we've been looking for it other bodies of the solar system. So we've been looking at these ocean worlds. Cassini, 10 years at Saturn, did beautiful images and spectra of all the moons. And again, I, I'm filling this talk with the results of all these amazing spacecraft, but this is how we're looking at the universe today with all these amazing images and spectra and uh, data about the environment. And um, how they figured out we might have an ocean, a liquid ocean underneath the crust of Enceladus is through its gravity, because a spacecraft would fly around the moon or near the moon on these um, flybys very close and would look for gravity distortions. It had a, a difference in, in density. Jupiter's moon also potentially may have liquid water. So we have images from Voyager 2, which visited in 1979, Galileo, which visited in 1997, and then um, they have these cracks on the surface. Um, but then just recently, in the last few years, the Hubble Space Telescope has observed plumes. So these plumes are indicative of something subsurface that is trying to get themselves out. And um, the indirect evidence that we may have water on these moons, not to do with the gravity, but more with magnetic anomalies. So there's different ways that astronomers and planetary scientists are making sense of these weird worlds because they show variations. And we're still hunting for water closer to home. So the Dawn mission that visited Ceres, um, the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt, also had found it had shape and gravity measurements and flattened terrain, and it suggested a subsurface ocean. And just recently, a paper came out which indicated there may be actually, or had been recently, flowing water on Ceres' surface. They were looking at terrain, because see, water being an ingredient for life is one thing. It also has the ability to move mountains, cut out gullies. It has geological um, implications. So it's possible that there may have been uh, a patches of ice growing in a particular crater on, on Ceres um, that could show that there's liquid water. It's just observationally. And then we've been looking for water on Mars. I mean, water on Mars today uh, exists primarily in the form of ice at the polar caps and a trace amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, Mars's atmosphere is primarily um, carbon dioxide. Um, where Mars, Mars's water went and how, taking most of Mars' atmosphere with it, is one of the biggest mysteries, most of the biggest environmental mysteries. So kind of understanding war Mars's water past um, helps us um, look at these uh, water cycles on planet worlds. But curiously, just a few months ago, Mars Express potentially detected a subsurface lake, of potentially water, um, below the southern ice cap, and this could be the first ever evidence of stable liquid water on another body outside of the Earth. So it's a very tantalizing observation. The characteristics of this lake beneath the Mars surface is very similar to finding... Subsurface lake. And uh, very similar to subsurface lakes that they've been finding in Antarctica. So these techniques to look for liquid water, the quest is still on. So understanding where the water is in our solar system, how it got transported, particularly how did it get transported to us where we live, and it helps us perhaps better understand, well, would better understand how we all formed, whether that water came from interstellar space or it was a result of processing. 
and it's geologically interesting because it carves out things, it creates um, you know, different um, features on the surfaces of worlds. It can transport material, it could be forming these geysers. So water can also be a resource, and that's where I come into the story. So scientifically is interesting for many reasons, but I was involved in a different approach for water, looking at water as a resource. Very familiar object, our nearest neighbor in the solar system, the moon. Um, this is one of the parting images from taken by the Apollo 17 astronauts when they left the surface of the moon in December of 1972. Now, before we had telescopes, we called the dark parts of the moon mare, which is Latin for seas. So before we could actually look at the surface of the moon with our own eyes, you know, human, humanity just took what we saw around us and said, ah, oh, the moon must have oceans, the sea of tranquility, the sea of storms, the mare. Now, when we looked at it with, our, with telescopes and spectrometers and learning about composition, it's just made out of rocks and there isn't the water on the moon. And five decades ago, when we got our first Apollo samples, the first lunar samples back to Earth, they were bone dry. And so the moon became this dry place. Two decades ago, in the 1990s, um, there were two orbiting spacecraft that went to the moon with different instruments, and they were looking at different parts of the moon that hadn't really been mapped in great detail. These are the poles. And they had found a mystery. The poles of the moon have very strong hydrogen signatures, but we didn't know how that could be or why that should be. And they were correlated in the basins of craters that haven't seen sunlight in 4.6 billion years. And then around that time, there was even a reanalysis of the Apollo samples, which started to find there is some water. The water was in volcanic glasses. So bringing us up to a decade ago, um, where we actually worked on to go after this mystery, I was involved in a mission to test this hy hypothesis. Is the hydrogen at the poles of the moon in the form of water? If it were, it would become an incredible resource to be used for human explorers on the moon. Additionally, it could tell us a lot more about how water came to our Earth, scientifically, because we don't know the origin of water on our Earth. And if there is water on the moon, because the moon has been, in a sense, a time machine preserving the signature of the early solar system or the time it was formed, um, we can get a sense, looking back in time, what the water scenario was back then. So I worked on an impactor mission. Um, there I am in a clean room, because um, I built the payload for this, um, and we were called LCROSS, and we stood, stood beneath a orbiter called the LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And um, LRO is still in orbit around the moon, taking lots of beautiful pictures. And um, when we were putting together the payload, um, I had volunteered to do the calibration. I wound up being the integration and test manager. I did what's known as shakes and bakes. I would put things on vibe tables until they broke and then I'd fix them. I would put them in big thermal vac chambers and make sure everything was working at extreme temperatures. So I wound up you know, building these instruments to go explore. And what we did as an impactor mission, we actually took the upper stage of our launch vehicle. We launched on an Atlas V. We towed it around space and then we crashed it into the moon. And by doing that, we excavated the, the, the area of high hydrogen signature and um, uh, wanted to see what it was made out of. So I was also involved in the operations of that um, mission. And we were shooting in the dark because we were going where no person has gone before or no actual vehicle has gone before. And we crashed into the moon. And we created an ex we excavated the, the bottom of a particular crater on the South Pole. And we found water. We found both water ice and water vapor. And we found a whole bunch of other things. So we had many surprises. Over the last 10 years, with the India's uh, Chajayan um, spacecraft, Japanese Kaguya spacecraft in orbit around the moon, 
NASA's LRO mission, um, plus our impact we hit here, um, the blue dots are representing where there are substantial amounts of water ice on the moon. Our understanding of the moon is totally transformed. We have anywhere from 100 million to a billion tons of water, which again could be used for scientific resources. Can we understand where that water came from? What is that water like? Or can it be used for resources? So getting to the lab. So it turns out the model said that the, the water should be in the basins of the crater, but no one had actually done the experiment. So at the University of Colorado, a graduate student wanted to, to ask the questions, um, are the conditions right for excavating water from lunar soil? So they were doing measurements of the sublimation rate of water in a simulant um, to behave water at low temperatures and they were able to confirm they can actually extract the water. So from a scientific point of view, they measured the rates of how water can escape from being locked into a sort of a rocky matrix and actually measure it over a period of several days. And that's important because you have people like Kate Kreiderman, another graduate student at UCF, who's actually building an apparatus that would go on a rover to the moon someday and actually excavate the water. So this is an engineering of action, um, extracting the lunar water because we could then live off the land. And if you don't need to bring your water with you, the water is something you can drink. You can break it into hydrogen and oxygen, the oxygen you can breathe. The hydrogen and oxygen can be used for fuel. You can use the soil for um, making building materials. So. The, I was very honored and privileged to have um, an opportunity to be part of this discovery of water on the moon. So I'll, I'll wrap up. So these lab experiments, um, just three I showed you, they aim to ex uh, explain our fascinating universe. I'm the one who's been building the instruments to take the data. So when I worked on Spitzer, we were looking for the dusty universe, the fact that half of the light in the universe is seen at these long wavelengths of light. You have to go to the, the lab to understand what, how can you make the dust? What is its structure? What is its properties? Can that relate back to what the astronomers were seeing? And just yesterday, Cornelia uh, Yeager um, was making a mention in her talk at the conference that there's a lot of work out there because it turns out you can make different types of dust and they have the same spectral signature. So that means you don't have an, the exact answer of what you're actually seeing. So, and then when we come to ICE, um, working on the Pluto mission, New Horizons, going to a icy world for the first time and finding a whole slew of surprises and just one of many laboratory experiments trying to understand the complex and beautiful data set we learned on Pluto. And then a dabbling in water, being part of a mission where we did an interesting experiment and we wanted to get beneath the surface and excavate and we found that we know less about our nearest neighbor, the moon, than we know about a lot of other places in the solar system. And then to learn that, hey, water could be both scientifically interesting, geologically interesting, but also could be used as a resource for human exploration going forward. So I gave you a cosmic tasting menu of these three areas. And I'll end with a great quote um, from the late Stephen Hawking. Um, Remember to look up at the stars and not down at your feet. Try to make sense of what you see and wonder about what makes the universe exist. Be curious. And how difficult life may seem, there's always something you can do and succeed at. It matters that you don't give up. So I'm very pleased to be, spend this time with you to share some dabblings I've done in building instruments um, that have flown on balloons and on airplanes and in space. And I even did a kamikaze moon to, uh, mission to the moon. Um, it's been a fascinating voyage. But then following the science has been amazing. And it's this combination of the observational astronomers and also the laboratory scientists who are trying to help us make sense of this very fascinating universe. Hence, a cosmic tasting menu. There's a lot more to share with you, but I hope um, you enjoyed my short presentation. Thank you.
Kimberly, thank you very much indeed. Now, for those of you who are watching us online, it's shortly time um, to say goodbye to you. But before we do, if you do want to know more, then please follow the link that we're now showing on screen um, to the links with the Open University, where there's lots of opportunities to um, get involved in MOOCs and box and distance learning, or even study from a long way away for a degree. Thank you very much to those of us who've been joining us from all around the world tonight. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you.